So, off to Clara, who's awesome. That, that's a hard, Sally Francis is a hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm Clara Stage. I'm the chair of the Eden Historical Commission now. And um, welcome each and every one of you. We're so happy that you're here. And also happy that we can celebrate a day to honor a woman who had such wonderful accomplishments. So, at this point, we're going to let, we're going to let Sally Francis give you some more information. Thank you. Thank you, Clara, and welcome to everyone. And now our town mayor, Jimmy Stallings, is going to join us. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> He's coming. And also with Mr. Mayor, we have our town manager, Corey Good Gooden. Are you sure? And here they are. Welcome. So the town has declared today as Josephine Leary Day. And I will turn it over to our mayor. Okay. I'm going to take this bath bell so you can hear me. Good. And Clara is going to be up here. Okay. Is Adrian here? Oh, oh, oh Kiana yes. is here. Yes, she certainly is. Uh, she, she, she one moment. So you can present to Claire. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. We have a proclamation here honoring the life of Josephine Napoleon Williams Leary. And it reads, whereas since 1976, our country has been celebrating Black History Month to honor the accomplishments of black Americans that have strengthened America. And whereas the Eaton Historical Commission and the mayor and the Eaton Town Council desire to honor Josephine Napoleon Williams Leary, who was born into slavery in Williamston, North Carolina, in 1856 and received her freedom at the age of nine when the Civil War ended. And whereas in 1873, Josephine Napoleon, Napoleon Williams married Sweetie Archer Leary, and they moved to England, and by 1881, Joseph Napoleon Leary had successfully maneuvered the real estate market and owned six properties in England's Cheapside Historic Business District. And whereas in 1893, massive fire destroyed the entire east side of Cheapside, now known as the 400 block of South Broad Street, leaving Mrs. Leary her investment in a pile of ashes. And whereas, in 1894, Josephine Napoleon Leary optimistically rebuilt a number of her buildings, including her signature building located at 423 South Broad Street. That still proudly bears her name on the pediment atop of the front facade of the impressive triple store building erected as rental property. And whereas Josephine Napoleon Leary, born into slavery, died in 1923 at the age of 77, was a remarkable entrepreneur and businesswoman who achieved a level of success in the post-Civil War era that deserves to be celebrated as part of Black History Month. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the Eden Town Council express their admiration and appreciation for the incredible life Josephine Napoleon Leary lived. And be it further resolved that the mayor and town council hereby declare February 22, 2022 as Josephine Napoleon Leary Day in Eden and urge all citizens to reflect on the life and accomplishment of this amazing businesswoman. And be it further resolved that a copy of this proclamation be spread upon the official minutes <coughs> books of the Eden Town Council as a lasting testament of the admiration the Town of Eden Historical Commission and our citizens have for the life of Josephine Napoleon Leary led in Eden. 
adopted this 22nd day of February, 2022. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a beautiful tribute to a beautiful woman. Kim, what do you think she would have said? <laughs> I bet she would have said amen. <laughs> so we do appreciate you all coming and making this a special day. Along with the welcome, I want to point out that Josephine Napoleon Leary is a very significant person that the world needs to know more about. In this room today, we have probably five of the six people who have done the most research about Josephine. Our speakers today, and also Dr. Ben Speller, we want to wave Ben. Um, and the person who could not be with us is Dorothy Redford, and she is the person who was formerly the executive director of uh, Somerset in Cresswell, and she did the really first deep digging on gathering together the facts about Josephine Napoleon Leary's life, and she sends her best wishes, and, but could not be with us today. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Alexis Tobias Jacon, and she is the historian at the Barker House, and she's going to present the facts of Josephine's life. Alexis is a graduate of Providence College in Rhode Island. She and her husband have moved to Edenton, and her husband, Jared, is the librarian in Columbia. And we are fortunate to have Alexis on the staff at the Barker House. And I now give you Alexis. Thank you very much, Miss Sally Francis. Good afternoon, everybody. It is such an honor to be here speaking with you today um, in honor of this truly remarkable individual, Josephine Napoleon Williams Leary. Now, as we heard from Mayor Stallings while reading the declaration, we know that Mrs. Leary was a woman who was born into slavery, who went on to become one of the most successful businesswomen and black businesswomen in our region's history. Now, to truly understand that depth of accomplishment, I first want to talk about a, a little bit about what it means that Josephine was born into slavery. When we think about slavery, we think about a situation where one person does not have control over their own life. They are beholden to another human being. But part of that institution was developed through a number of laws and legal realities. And there are two that I would like to point out that really come to bear on Josephine's story. The first is that in America, the American system of slavery was chattel slavery that was matrilineal, which means it was inherited through the mother. Now, while through Ms. Redford's research, she believes that the family tradition always held that Josephine's father was a wealthy white man, because her mother was, was enslaved, Josephine was automatically born into slavery. The other part of chattel slavery means that an enslaved individual is not considered to be an individual under the law, but instead property of another human being. And as such, this individual was not able to own property in his or her own right. The other law that really impacted Josephine's early days was that in North Carolina, under the North Carolina Constitution, um, enslaved people were not allowed to know how to read. They were not allowed to be educated by other enslaved people, except in arithmetic. They were not allowed to know how to read or write. So it is truly amazing that in the 1870 census, the first census ever taken after the Civil War, meant that all of these millions of people were now free. In the 1870 census, young Josephine Williams, who now has a last name, is going to school the first out of her family, the first of her generation, her mother, her grandmother, and all of her ancestors enslaved here in America, the first to be able to learn legally 
how to read and write without fear of retribution from the law. We know in 1870 she is also living with her grandmother Millie and a young boarder, a very dashing barber named Sweetie Leary. This is back in Williamston. And in the next three years, Josephine and Sweetie would not only be married, but they also relocated to Edenton. Josephine had taken up the barbering trade in her own right. And in early 1873, she does something so amazing that is still kind of hard to believe to this day. About 10 years since the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect and the enslaved of the South were formally free, in those 10 years, this young woman became a property owner in her own right. She purchased a vacant lot up in Elizabeth City off of Road Street. Interestingly enough, her husband, Sweetie, tried to purchase the property first, but a couple months later, she actually went and was able to pay for the whole lot in full. $550 in hand, which is a considerable, massive investment, especially at the time. Now, I want you all to consider that back in this time, the cost of a haircut and going to see a barber would have been between 10 and 25 cents, with particular add-ons, because barbers back in those days um, pretty much ran spas, an early version of it. So just think about 10 cents per haircut, what that $550 meant to that particular family and to her financial freedom. The following year, she gives birth to her eldest daughter, the first Williams Leary person who was not born into slavery. And she would later on make sure that Clara and her little sister Florence would receive the best possible education. In July of 1875, Josephine purchases the former Cheshire storehouse located on three lots at the end of South Broad Street. What's really fascinating is that not only does she make this purchase, but she also has written into the deed that this, these lots are her own separate estate free from rights and control of her husband. Back in 1868, the Constitution was amended so that married women could keep control over their own properties free of control of her husband. And by making this purchase, Josephine ensured that her daughters would forever potentially be financially solvent and be protected. Later on in 1881, she purchases the building and lot at 317 South Broad Street, which is likely where she and her husband were renting to have their barbershop. This becomes the Josephine Napoleon Leary Barbershop, and in 1907, she constructs the brick structure that still stands today and is the home of Javon Fashions. Now, unfortunately, in 1893, a massive fire devastated that whole entire section of South Broad Street where her three buildings of the Chester Storehouse originally stood. Um, as we heard from Mary Stallings reading the declaration, it was devastating. It was her largest, most successful investment, and it went up into smoke. She could have given up. We would all understand that. But she didn't. Even though she was fighting with her husband, having marital problems, um, she had so much stress going on with her personal life. Her beloved brother and his wife had just left Edenton to move to Washington, D.C., and everything around her probably looked bleak. She decided to keep fighting. She contracted with Edenton builder Theo Ralph and designed the beautiful, magnificent J.N. Leary building that still stands today, home of the Chow and Herald newspaper for many, many years. In spite of this triumph, just a couple of years later, she loses her mother, her beloved grandmother, her husband, and her son-in-law. And so in just a matter of few years, the family has experienced so much tremendous loss that it changes them forever. But again, instead of giving up, Josephine keeps going. As I mentioned before, she constructs the new brick building where her barbershop was located, and she continued to buy and sell properties throughout Chowan County, all to continue to try and build her portfolio so her children would be provided for after she passes away. But unfortunately, fate sometimes takes a different course, and Josephine falls ill, terribly, terribly ill. She develops stomach cancer. And for the last few years of her life, she has to go seek treatment for this cancer and continues fighting to try and survive. 
Unfortunately, as we all know, medical treatments do not come cheap. And Josephine sadly ends up mortgaging almost the entire J. N. Leary building and having to sell her lots in Elizabeth City and some other Edenton holdings as well. Yet, she still did not give up. She kept going. And even in the face of financial ruin, even when she's in her 60s and her body was breaking down, Josephine still decided that she was going to do whatever it took to keep her family healthy. And she went and actually started to apply for jobs as a domestic worker in various places throughout the country and sought employment even up until her death. Finally, unfortunately, Josephine passed away in 1923 from this terrible cancer. But her daughter went and designed the most lavish and beautiful funeral she could to honor the life of her mother, who had worked so long and so hard to build one of the most beautiful and meaningful real estate empires that Edenton has ever seen. Why I personally love Josephine Leary is because she is a woman that I think we need to hear about in 2022. She is a woman who in the face of so many obstacles and so much hardship, both because of her gender and race, she overcame them time and time again. She built her American dream, but even when she found that her dream was fragile, she did not give up. She kept going. And even though she found financial ruin, she was able to pass away knowing that she came from a situation in which she did not have control over her own life to becoming one of the most successful businesswomen in our history, um, estimated to have been worth up to $10 million at the height of her career. And she sent her daughters to college, the first generation free, and they went and got college degrees. If there's anything that can speak to how much we are, as a human race, are able to go on and to continue on in the face of struggles and confusing times, it is the legacy of Josephine Leary. Thank you. And you'll notice um, you should have a map. Lexi put the map together. It shows you where Josephine's properties are if you want to drive and look. And it also gives a recap of the timeline. Now I would like to introduce to you Bob Quinn. And Bob is a graduate of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He had a career as a Marine. He traveled the world. He was a very successful entrepreneur. He eventually decided it was time to come back to his beloved northeastern North Carolina and became a member of the Edenton Historical Commission and also was elected to several terms as a town council member. Bob. Here I come. <laughs> it's great to see you out here and to have such a following for such a great subject. You gave a very energized speech. I'm going to give a little soft time with you. I'm not that energized, but I got to tell you. I heard from so many people, Edenton has no museum. I heard people say that. My response always was, Edenton does not need a stuffy museum. Edenton is a museum unto itself. That's the thought that drove me to create the Eaton Museum Trail. In late 2014, I began writing outlines and potential information to make it a reality. Put together
together the stuff to introduce the concept. It took well over a year to get it underway, and it wasn't until 2016 that we planted our first signs. Museums show things that depict history, often without telling the story that embellishes what you're seeing. Our walking trail tells you why it's on the trail. It creates the, in, the image, embellishes it, and hopefully excites imagination and understanding of why it's there. The trail relives the object and its story, hopefully a memory-making experience for passing in the past in the museum. Edenton's history runs deep, well over its documented years, well in excess of the 300 years. Before our first settlers, I think of Edenton's area as being an Indian water world surrounded by a beautiful environment that we enjoy today. It was our first state's capital, 1712 to 1743. The trail has a lot to tell about famous forefathers, amazing stories, plus it gives you the enjoyment of a quiet stroll through history. Conceptually, the trail idea was, um, was embraced by the Edenton Historical Commission. Funding bloomed from their membership. Contributions were specifically specified for the museum trail. I look in this room and I know that many of you made contributions in behalf of the trail. The Edenton Women's Club endorsed it and published a booklet to support it and they also provided funding for the trail. Their booklet, Edenton Walking Tour Guide, extended, extended and expanded supporting the concept with the financial support. In essence, we were set on creating a unique way to enjoy Edenton's history, which history is so important to our state and nation. Where it began, the people who were involved, an opportunity to read, feel, and see history and its impact in its original setting. Uniquely enjoying a moving experience. <clears throat> Since its beginning, I've had many calls saying, how do you do such a thing? Or, or they say, what was your motivation to do it? The how-to was very easy. It was easy because Edenton is a unique place unto itself. It's a unique town, proud of its history, has enjoyed long, long, and steady leadership and many devoted organizations that understand the importance of history. It, the town, has a creative spirit and a welcoming spirit. 
I feel that we have a vibrance that our tracks and endures through good and bad times, and it has throughout, throughout its existence. There are many that deserve recognition for the Museum Trail's success beyond me. But I cannot talk about this without recognizing one key player, Bill Ahearns, who's sitting over here. <laughs> He's got his hand up. It's amazing, Bill. You can lift that thing. Knowing <laughs> you. <laughs> Bill's a creative genius on whom I depended greatly. And I have to be honest, without Bill, the trail would just be a good idea undone in a closed drawer without Bill's touch. A motivation that I have was to enhance history interest and understanding of history who we are and including people like Josephine Leary, who I feel inspire and help make history. Her name never appeared on historic records. There was no sign declaring her as a famous Edentonian. However, her pride and her declaration atop her building J. N. Leary, 1894, could not be overlooked and sparked my curiosity. Who was J. N. Leary? Research on J. N. Leary was difficult, but amazing when I found it. It opened my world to Josephine Napoleon history. Josephine Napoleon Leary. And the decision to add her to the museum trail, which I believe is the nucleus for this event today. Without the trail, you would know anything about J. N. Leary, and I've seen many stop at that sign and walk away with a new impetus on life. Such an amazing thing when finding and adding it to the trail J. N. Leary, Josephine, I learned was this an inspiring, amazing lady. As we've said before, released from slavery at nine years old. She led a life deserving to be included among our forebearers. A lady with a gift. A lady with grit, soul, and an I-can-do-it spirit. A story that deserves to be known. And an inspiring legend for all of us to follow. I feel it was a task worth doing. I'm blessed to have had a hand in her discovery. She deserves care and pride in telling her story. I feel, as I know you will, it is a monumental and inspiring image for all of us to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And now, the rest of the story. We have with us today Sarah Younger, who is the literary agent, who happened to visit Edenton and saw Bob's museum trail, and her interest was sparked in Josephine Leary. 
we have Anne-Marie <coughs> Knighton. If you all haven't met Anne-Marie, she is the recently retired town manager. Sarah contacted, well, I'm going to let <laughs> Kiana Alexander tell you the story. We have with us today Kiana Alexander, who was born in Durham, went to high school in Durham, went to college in Raleigh at St. Augustine University. She has been living in Fayetteville for 15 years. She is the mother of an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old. And what you won't know by looking at her is that she spent the morning with about a hundred high school students. We met with five different classes, two history classes, you know, two English classes, and three history civics classes. And she was so inspiring and motivating. And I think because of that morning, there are going to be many more authors in the works. <laughs> but we are delighted to have you with us. Sarah, we thank you for uh, finding Kiana and Kiana finding you and and Marie getting the ball rolling so that we could have this wonderful experience today with Josephine, Napoleon, Williams, Leary Day. So thank you. Oh, hi everybody. Hi. Um, I'm Kiana Alexander, uh, proud Duramite. Uh, proud faculty of uh, St. Augustine University in Raleigh. Um, it's funny that she talked about my time this morning with um, the high schoolers at John A. Holmes. Um, five classes, varying levels of interest and attention were paid. Um, some very interesting questions. Um, but I spent a lot of this morning suppressing laughter. And since I've been sitting here, I spent a lot of time suppressing tears. Um, this whole thing is very emotional for me in that I spent so much time learning about Mrs. Leary's life and her story, seeing a lot of parallels between her life and mine, um, that I feel a very strong connection to her. Knowing that um, this day has been declared in her honor and that I could be a part of bringing attention to everything she accomplished feels very special to me, it feels like something that I was called to do, and I'm, I'm just extremely excited about this whole enterprise. <laughs> So I just wanted to start with that. Um, so it all started from Twitter. <laughs> the story begins on Twitter. When Sarah was here visiting town and happened upon uh, Mrs. Leary's historical marker and took to the internet and said, why is it that I don't know about this person? Someone should write a book about her. Who is going to do it? To which I replied, I'll do it. <laughs> because this is just my sort of thing, um, African American history and American history, especially in this time period, are sort of catnip to me. I'm a history nerd at heart. Um, so this was something that immediately grabbed my attention, and I knew that um, I wanted to look into it. Even if nothing ever came of the project, I wanted to know more about Mrs. Leary and the life that she lived. And the more research that I did, um, traveling here to Edenton, traveling to Duke University, where her papers are held, um, the more I was tied into, okay, this story needs to be told. And I'm here through all this set of circumstances that's led me here because I'm the person who's meant to tell it. Mrs. Leary doesn't have any living descendants that we know of. Her younger daughter, Flory, married a Chinese man as an adult, and they immigrated to China, and Flory never returned. So we don't know if she may have like uh, descendants who may still be living in China. Um, but in terms of what we know, her last living descendant was a woman named Dr. Maureen Pelham, who was the granddaughter of her brother Octavius, who became a noted physician in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, she passed away in the year 2000. Um, her grandson, Percy Reeves, lived most of his life here in Edenton. Um, it's buried right here in Vine Oak Cemetery. Um, he was the one who had the forethought to take those dusty old papers that she left behind and donate them to Duke University. Um, in the early 90s, which forms the basis of most of the research that's been done on Mrs. Leary's life. Um, so you've already heard a lot about... Kiana, yes. could you put that on the... I want them to be able to hear it on the... Okay. I'm sorry, thank you. 
Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you've heard a lot about um, the facts of Mrs. Leary's life. Um, and we, we kind of overlap the research between um, what you've heard from Alexis, the things that um, Ms. Redford was able to find. Um, her booklet that she wrote about Mrs. Leary was sort of a research guide for me and that I used it as a starting point. Okay, these are the places I need to go, the things I need to look into in order to expand on the narrative. And a lot of the other research was through newspapers like the Fisherman and Farmer and newspapers in this area, which gave social reports, even ads in the newspapers um, became research for me. Um, like there's the cabinet maker slash undertaker, Louis F. Ziegler that's mentioned in the story based on an ad that I found in the Fisherman Farmer that was a real person. That was his real business. I found an ad for his business. Cabinets made, caskets made. So I'm like, okay, this is a real person. Now I take my license as an author and fictionalize him as a person. But we know from the advertisement in the newspaper that he was actually a real person. So there was a lot of building characters around the names and the businesses that I could find. Um, I try to stick as close to the information that's factual that we know about Mrs. Lee's life as possible and only fictionalize the day-to-day -day things and the gaps that needed to be filled in. So that's to give you sort of an idea of how much of the story is factual versus how much is fictional. Because there are some things about Mrs. Leary's life that we just cannot know because they weren't recorded. Um, so those are the things that I had to fictionalize, but I tried to stick as close as I could to what we knew about her and what would make sense during the time period that she lived in. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty much my whole spiel. We've <laughs> heard a lot about her life, and I found her story remarkable in that I see a lot of the same parallels and things that she had to overcome still happening today. We still have issues with racism. We still have issues with sexism, with misogynoir. All the things that she faced in order to accomplish the things that she had in her heart, the dreams that she had for herself to leave a legacy for her family are still issues today um, to a lesser degree. But the idea of overcoming rejection, overcoming setbacks, overcoming all the obstacles that might be thrown in your path to me is very familiar. Um, I started out in publishing in 2009 after spending the better part of four or five years writing that first book, editing the first book, revising the first book, figuring out how to submit it, figuring out the process of getting the book into the right hands and then being rejected once I finally figured out that process. The same way she was self-taught in real estate, I was self-taught in publishing. I learned everything on my own. I had people that I went to who mentored me, um, like Beverly Jenkins, who's a legend of historical romance, um, but it was very much in the trenches. I learned how to do it by doing it over and over again, failing at it over and over again, and finally figure, figuring it out. And that's the same way that she learned to do everything that she accomplished in real estate. So I felt kind of a kinship with her. The stories kind of run parallel to each other. And I also had a family. So I had to also juggle publishing, writing, revising, editing, marketing, all of those things with raising children, just as Mrs. Leary did in her time. So there were a lot of parallels between my life and hers that made me feel a certain closeness to her the more I learned about her. And finishing this book was somewhat emotional for, for me because I knew that I was sort of leaving behind the world that she lived in, the world that I created for her. But it's something that's always gonna stay with me because our lives are so closely tied together. The paths that we're traveling, they might be separated by a gulf of time of 150 or 200 years, but there are so many similarities that I just couldn't look past them. Um, and I feel like the most important thing that I want people to take away from the story is perseverance over everything. It's what I talked to the students about this morning. Ignore all the people who say you can't do it. Do it anyway. The best revenge is to show them that you can do it. Yeah. If spite has to be your motivation, that's fine. That's valid. <laughs> if you do it just to prove to them that you can, that's fine. Um, 
don't let anyone stand in your way of the dreams and the goals that are in your heart. So perseverance is like the main, I think probably the main crux of her life. It was probably her main, the main takeaway from her life. And the second is legacy. Legacy for women has often been placed in motherhood. What you accomplish as a mother and a wife, how clean is your house, how well dressed are your children, how well educated they are. And I think that too much emphasis has been placed on that because it puts pressure on women to put aside their own dreams in favor of motherhood and marriage. And those two things can coexist. You can have marriage, you can have motherhood, you can also have your own life, your own dreams, your own interests, which are not tied to those of your spouse or your children. The legacy that your children leave is theirs. The legacy that you leave is yours. It's not tied to what they accomplish, it's tied to what you do. And what you accomplish does not need to be momentous in order for you to leave a legacy. If you do nothing but be a loyal friend to one person, you have made an impact. And I think that's something that needs to be spoken about more because we can take this undue pressure off of women to spend all their time in caretaking roles when they can be doing something else. So I think those are the two main takeaways that I would really like readers to have from this book. Thank you for writing the book. So we are so fortunate that now Josephine, Napoleon, Williams, Larry is going out into the world, thanks to you, Kiana. And what questions do you all have? And I have a burning question. The title, as you can see, is Carolina Built. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that come to be? Uh, the title, titling any book is like usually a very long discussion. Um, and this was like no exception to that. I started out knowing that I wanted the word built in the title. And for the longest time, that was the working title, just the word built. Um, and so we started talking back and forth between Sarah and I and my editor at Gallery about what should be added to it. The title was pithy at one word, but it wasn't really giving a clear sense of place. And so I'm like, where did it take place in North Carolina? North Carolina built didn't sound right, like that was too much, but Carolina built was perfect. So that's how we came around to the title. Mm -hmm. and, and what about the jacket design? Um, that was also a whole debate. The, <laughs> we were trying to figure out a way to portray her without using her actual image, but using someone who looked similar to her. Um, and so that the cover would speak to a person walking past it in the bookstore, and they would immediately know it was historical fiction, not a biography. So that was kind of how we started out thinking about the cover. We wanted her image to be in black and white, but we wanted the background and everything around it to be very vibrant, which is like symbolic of everything she accomplished. Like, she was living in this time period, you know it's an older time period by the black and white image that she is represented with, but the gilded um, brocade that's around her and the bright color was to let you know, hey, there's something remarkable about this woman. She was living in a black and white world, but she was living in color. Oh, nice. And, and since I got to spend the morning with uh, Ms. Alexander, uh, tell them more about your process growing into being a published author? Okay, so I started out in 2004 working on a manuscript for a romantic suspense slash thriller um, in my cousin's office. She had a home office. She lived up in Richmond. I was staying with her and uh, I was with her right around the time I turned 21. So. She would go to work during the day at the Army Hospital where she worked in insurance. And I was just kind of puttering around her house and she was like, well, you know, you said you have this book you're working on, you can use my computer. She had a home office, I used her computer. And that was where I wrote my first manuscript um, with her intense encouragement. Um, she was about 10 years older than me. Her name was Tanya Davis. Um, she passed away in 2013. But, um, she was my biggest cheerleader in that she demanded a chapter a day when she came home from work. <laughs> she was like, you're here all day. You don't have anything else to do. I want you to finish this book. And I'm invested. I want to know what happens. 
So every day I'm going to come home and you're going to have me a chapter. And if you're not writing, you're not eating. And she had a deep freezer with a key. And she would take all the foods that she knew I liked and put them in the deep freezer. Even if they didn't need to be frozen, she put them in the deep freezer and locked it and took the key to work. Now, if I wanted the good stuff, when she got home, I better have that chapter, and then I could get the key. So that was her way of <laughs> that was her way of encouraging me to finish that first draft. And it ha if it had not been for her pushing me the way she did, I probably would never have finished it. And she knew that. Um, so I always, when I speak, I try to always say her name in remembrance of what she did for me. She gave me almost what um, Harper Lee's friends gave her. She gave me a safe place to to write. Um, and, and work my craft without placing any parameters on me. She refused to take, I was staying with her, but she refused to take rent from me, any of that. She just wanted me to write. Um, so when, the, when that first book came out, I dedicated it to her. And even though she's gone now, I know she's always with me. And I'm glad that she lived to see that book be published and know that it was dedicated to her. So that's how I got started um, in the business. And that book, I went through years and years of rejection and first there were form letters and then there were we think it's okay but maybe work on your plotting or we think it's okay but maybe work on your characterization and then I started to um, realize that there was valid criticism inside of it give myself the time to grieve and be hurt that I was rejected but then get back to work let's take what's constructive in this letter and use that to improve my writing and that's what I've been doing ever since how many books 41. <laughs> and did you break some um, glass ceilings? I did. Um, I was the first um, African American romance to be published um, by Source Books in 2017. And I will soon be the first African American lesbian romance to be published by Montlake Publishing under Amazon. Um, that book is coming out in July. Now, what questions do you all have? Yes. Thank you for being here. As you're sitting in front of the computer writing this book, what was the point at which you thought I hit the stumbling block, and what was it? Um, most of the time when I felt kind of stuck with this story, it was my brain kind of getting wrapped up in minutia, a detail that wasn't quite right or something I did not know, and I was so determined that it be accurate, I would just sort of like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, there was this whole thing with her teaching Clara to drive, and I'm like, I know nothing about horses or driving a buggy or any of that. So when I started to write that scene, I was all into the conversation between the three people in the scene, which was Josephine, her sister-in-law, and her daughter. And then as I got to the part where they actually had to do the driving, I was like, wait a minute, I don't know what, I don't know what to put here, because I don't know what they're doing. So I just had to leave the manuscript, go on the internet, and start searching up, okay, how do you, dri how do you drive a, a horse and buggy? <laughs> because I was not going to get it wrong. So my, my main times when I get stuck in a story, it's a research question. I want to know the right thing to put in the story to make it as accurate as possible. Um, creatively, I rarely get stuck. Like, conversations from characters are always going on inside of my head. It's the, the minute details of things that tend to kind of hang me up and get me, get me out of the story so that I have to go looking for it so, because I want to make sure it's right. Someone else? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you are such a prolific writer. Are you thinking of more than one book at the time, or is it this book, and now we're going to do this book, and that book, or do you have a couple going on at the same time? There are always several stories going on at once, and they're all in various stages of production. <laughs> like, some of them are just, like, the echoes of dialogue from characters who have yet to be written, and then there's currently stories in progress that I'm writing, things that are in editing, things that are being published, things that are being marketed. So. Like right now, this book just came out today. I know I have a book coming out in July, and they've already started the publicity for that book. And then I'm already writing the next book to that book. So I'm writing the sequel to the July book. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm currently writing. So I'm thinking about Mrs. Leary and that this book comes out today, and now there's all these things that are tied to that. But I'm also thinking about the other stories I have in progress. So because I'm under contract, 
um, there is a lot of overlap between stories and genres and characters, and it's all a jumble in there. <laughs> um, so my, my main thing is trying to like kind of weave through it to what I need to focus on right now. <laughs> Congratulations on your launch date. Yay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yes, it's wonderful that the launch date is today in Edenton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't think of a better place to do it because this is where it all happened. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? What would you say to a young woman, white or black, who are trying to develop um, their own book or nowadays so many people are doing computer blogs? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them to motivate them to just do it? Um, to protect their writing time. And even if that means you have to sort of go off into a closet and lock yourself in, mm -hmm. let the people you live with know that you're writing and you're not to be disturbed. If they try to disturb you, <laughs> ignore them. Um, and also ignore people who tell you that you can't. Um, that it's not a viable career, that what you want to write isn't worth writing, any of that stuff. Ignore all of that. Remember that the only way to prove that something can be done is to do it. All things seem impossible until someone's done it. Then once you've done it, well, that idea is out the window. So the main thing is protecting your writing and the time that goes into it, ignoring people who say you can't do it, and following your passion. I've started my career writing in uh, women's fiction and romance and pivoting now into historical fiction. This is where my passion has always been. My passion has always been in African American history, in American history. So this is where I'm going. It's not where I started, but it's always where I knew I was going to go. So sometimes you have to take kind of a crooked path to get there, but this is where I was meant to be. All things happen in good time. Yes, sir. I have a bit of a plant of a question. <laughs> Since you just said that historical fiction is your passion, where would you like to go next? What historical figures, maybe one or two, would you like to write about next in this space? Just to give them a little taste. Um, I've been thinking a lot about Hiram Rhodes Rebels, um, who was the first African American in Congress, who was from Fayetteville. He was also a barber, coincidentally. <laughs> and he ended up taking the seat that was vacated by Jefferson Davis when Jefferson Davis left to become president of the Confederacy. Um, and not a lot has been written about him. Also have been thinking a lot about Dr. Anna Julia Cooper. Um, because she lived well into the 1960s, there's a lot written about her and also written by her. But I think there are, there are parts of her life that have been glossed over in favor of her academic career that I would really like to dig into and um, also Charlotte Hawkins Brown and all the work that she did for education of black women um, in 19th century North Carolina. Looking forward. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Claire. Do you have any favorite authors that you felt really inspired you even as a child? Um, I'm always going to say Beverly Jenkins. <laughs> Beverly <laughs> Jenkins has always been um, like my favorite author and it was picking up her book um, Night Song in the 90s. Night, it came out in 1995 and that was her first book and it was the first time I had looked at a cover and seen people who look like me in a historical setting and that was what got my attention. Like I was so excited that they were obviously like on the prairie, there was a horse in the background. I was like, oh, oh, this is historical. I have to read this. And that book just, it did something to me. It made me, I knew how it made me feel, even though I couldn't describe it. And I wanted to write something that would make someone else feel that way. Um, and so that was sort of where it began for me. So I'm always going to go back um, to Beverly Jenkins. I read a lot of Edgar Allan Poe, Ambrose Bierce, um, Shakespeare, Stephen King. Um, also in romance, Brenda Jackson. Um, Francis Ray, um, Gwen Forster, some of the like architects of black romance. Um, these were the stories that were approachable to me, that starred people who looked like me, that were showing me experiences similar to my own. And so that was what sort of drew me into that world. And, and yes, 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, please. I just wanted to ask you, um, first of all, you're ex extremely inspiring, and I'm just so happy to be here, and your words are really compelling. I wanted to ask a question. Do you, has your, have, have any of your novels, have you ever thought about any of uh, your novels taking any other type of uh, forms, like maybe film, or maybe some type of uh, <laughs> art installation, or any facets of your novels that you think that they would, that they could possibly, you ever consider Yes, from the beginning, I've considered that. <laughs> Even my first book, I've always thought it would make a really good like three-part miniseries because it's a thriller, yeah. um, and there's sort of like the big reveal, and it's separated into three intersecting stories. Oh, nice. um, the way it was written is not at all the way like it's supposed to be written, but it was like my first book. I didn't know the rules then, and that's what right. makes it good because I wrote it the way I wanted to write it. Nobody was telling me, "Hey, you can't, you can't have three couples at the same." So I did that. So I think it would make a really good miniseries because there are three intersecting storylines. Um, but every time I sit down to write, to me it is a movie because that's how I see it in my head. Um, and we're always looking for those types of opportunities. I think this book is with a film agent right now, isn't it? Yeah, we're with multiple film agents and also um, we've had a couple producers. Unfortunately, Mandela Productions was really interested, but they wanted to find something uh, more suited for feature film, and they felt this might be better suited for TV. Mm -hmm. But we've got a lot of interest, so it's exciting. Yeah, yeah and Sarah is like on it. Before <laughs> I thought of it, Sarah's like, hey, listen, I've got it out to this person and that person, and they're looking at it, and I just want to let you know, keep doing what you're doing, I've got this over here. So Sarah's a beast, like she's got it, she's got it on her radar. If you're thinking it, she's already thought it. <laughs> Someone else? Um, there, the women in my family have inspired me in my writing in terms of pursuing it. Um, when I think of like my own mother who raised my brother and I mostly as a single mother because my parents divorced when I was seven. When I think of like her determination um, and the way she sort of, sometimes it was held together with duct tape and prayer, but she got it done. Um, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, um, Lily Mae McKinnon, was a hairdresser in Durham. Um, way back in the 60s and 70s, she owned a, a hair salon in downtown Durham. And I didn't find out until after she passed that she had had um, Black Panther meetings in her back room, in the back room of the salon. I had no idea that was happening. I remember being very small when she had sold the salon but would still go there. Um, sitting on her lap while she got her hair done. She had the, the jerry curl. Um, and I would be sitting on her lap while she was getting her hair done, not knowing that any of that happened in her shop until after she had passed away. So there are all those sorts of stories that I'm still learning because I've been researching my own genealogy for a few years now. I'm building my family tree. Um, I'm still learning all the things that the women who came before me accomplished, which is why I wrote the dedication the way I did, because I know there's so many I don't know about, but they've done something that led to me being I think we have time for one more question. A burning question, anyone? Tell about the um, your ninth grade um, experience that led you to truly think you could be a writer. Oh, Mr. Tab. Okay, so <laughs> if you if you are from this area, you may know that name, Wendell Tab. He taught um, drama at Hillside High School from probably the 80s on through into the 2000s. He probably retired maybe two or three years ago. Over 30 years teaching drama um, at the same school in different buildings. The school moved, he didn't. Um, and I had him as my elective. I had drama in ninth grade, so this was 1996-97 um, school year. And we had a midterm project to write a one-act play. Um, and that was going to be our midterm. That was going to make up our biggest grade of the semester. And at the time, there were a lot of like really serious issues going on, and my classmates, being so aware of everything happening around them, wrote all these very serious plays. There was teen pregnancy, and AIDS, and drug use, and suicide, and all these very deep, heavy topics. Um, and my play was not like that at all. <laughs> my play was about was a fantasy sort of story about a teenager 
going next door to her neighbor's house that she's never been to, but they've lived next door to this lady for years and years. She goes next door to borrow sugar for a cake and discovers that that lady is a witch. And she gets kind of caught up in a spell and has to figure out how to get out and get back home. <laughs> so that play really stood out amongst all the very serious topics <laughs> that were being presented. And Mr. Tab just had this look on his face like, I don't even know what, what's going on. This is brilliant. Um, we had to tape record the plays. Um, because that was part of the, so the person who was chosen as a videographer from the class, that was their grade. So that was their part of the project to take the place. They had to frame it, make sure the lighting was right and all that stuff. Um, so there's a dusty VH test, VHS tape somewhere of this play. <laughs> he told me that he had shown it to classes like years on um, until the VCR broke. Um, I went back to speak to his class in 2017. But he said to me, you are a writer. He didn't say, maybe you should be a writer. Have you thought about writing? He said, you are a writer. I've never seen anything like this. You are a writer. This is what you're meant to do. And he affirmed something in me that I didn't even know was there at the time. And it was the first time somebody had said something like that to me. And it made me think. It could put a little seed in the back of my mind like, oh. With all this confusion about what am I going to do when I leave high school, that was the first little seed planted that maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. So that was kind of when I really started thinking seriously about it. And then the, it was the very next year that I stumbled across that Beverly Jenkins book. And I was like, okay, we, we're doing this. We're going to have to figure this out, but we're going to do it. So we are grateful to Mr. Tab. Yes, yes. yes. Little Tab. <laughs> because now Josephine, Napoleon, Williams, Leary, has been channeled through <laughs> the museum trail and now through Kiana Alexander and now out into the world. Mm -hmm. So we thank you. And thank you, Bob, and thank you. Lexi also, did I say she has a map if you want to drive around and see some of the, the buildings mm -hmm. that uh, were Josephine's. So your job today and for the rest of your time is to take Josephine out into the world so that we all appreciate this remarkable woman. So thank you all for being with us today. <laughs>